Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Indike, and I'm an addict and an alcoholic. Um, all right, my experience, strength, and hope. So, um, I guess I'll start off by saying I have 15 months sober, which thank you. it's the longest time that I've had. I've been in AA since January 1st of 2017. And for about the first 18 months, I was the newcomer. Um, Since practically the day that I was born, I kind of was born into addiction and alcoholism, and my father loved to remind me of it, warned me of it almost all the time, especially as I got into high school and college, was you know, for telling me that I was bound to be an alcoholic because it's in my family. But of course, I had to prove him wrong. Yeah, I only proved them right. Um, I think, you know, what it was like, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on that, but it was mostly feeling different than finding something to change the way that I was feeling trying to fit in, and never quite succeeding. I still, like, even when I used, I still kind of felt like I was on the outside. And finally, it ended up with me smoking lots and lots of weed by myself all the time. And, you know, I have many different substances that I've substituted along the years, And even though none of them really worked, I still tried really hard to make them work. But I think, you know, I was fortunate enough to make it through college, which I never thought that I'd go through. And, you know, I kind of went a little backwards and got my AA after my BA. And then Uh after my AA, when I was done taking a bunch of random classes, I was like, what do I do next? So I went to grad school Went to grad school, finished grad school, and right at the end of grad school, I was like, I think I have a problem. And, you know, I had made it that far, so of course I was like, I'm a functioning addict, and, you know, kind of tried to make that work for a little while. But I think I soon realized that I'm just really unhappy, and I... I was actually at the doctor's, and he was, I was telling him my story, and he's like, mm, you might want to check out Marijuana's Anonymous, and so I kind of went to that and decided that wasn't for me, and went back out and just fooled around a little bit, and then finally on January 1st of 2017, after a really, really drunk New Year's Eve, I found AA, and When I came to AA, I think it was because, you know, my dad told me that, you know, I'm probably going to have a problem. And so when I started, it was, okay, I'm going to do this for my dad because he was right. Mm -hmm. And after kind of being in AA for a little while, I think I soon realized, well, not soon, but I finally realized that I needed to be here for myself. And... After trying by myself for about a year and a half, I finally decided to go to rehab, and it was there in rehab that I really had the opportunity to get sober, because while, you know, I think there was some psychic change going on, I really needed to be removed from any chance of using so that I could be successful, and so I ended up at New Bridge, and I feel so fortunate for New Bridge. And I just, I'm still a part of Newbridge now, even 15 months later, because I know that without it, once I truly let go, I just, I'm a little scared that I might, you know, but 
Um, I think at the end of the day, it really brings me back to service. And so, you know, they talk about the community, about, you know, the fellowship and service and going to meetings. And I do all of those things. And I am also working the steps. I am on my... I think I'm on my ninth sponsor. I've had a lot of sponsors, most of them unsuccessful, but you know, I really persisted and I really wanted to get sober and I knew what I needed to do. So I just kept trying and kept trying and I I'm on step nine. I'm so excited because it's the farthest I've ever gotten. And most people are, you know, intimidated by it, but I've been waiting so long to get this far. So I'm really excited, but I feel like a lot of, the promises are coming true. I just went down to LA where I'm from and I spent five days with my family. I, my dad told me this is, you know, one of the best experiences that he's ever had. I went down there with lots of money, not lots of money. Um, (laughs) Usually I go down with like $50 in my pocket, but I can actually like, I felt secure going down there. I bought my own plane ticket. I traveled. I did everything by myself. And I felt so proud of myself for being in that position. I have an amazing job now, which I feel so fortunate for being in AA because half the experiences that I have at work, I'm like, okay, what would I do if I was, okay, so the steps and, you know, this is what I've learned in rehab. And I get to applying all that to the experiences that I have today. And so, you know, when they say practice these principles in all your affairs, I feel like I get to do that. And I think, you know, I think, you know, I'm just, I'm very grateful for where I've gotten. And I know that I could not get there by myself because I tried. And I feel grateful that I now have a choice because I think before, you know, despite the fact that I wanted something different, I didn't have the ability to access it. But now I get to choose my mindset. I get to choose what kind of attitude I start the day with. I get to choose, you know, how I respond to situations. I get to act rather than react. And I wouldn't have been able to get this far if I didn't really take a look at my choices and my actions over my life. And that's really where the steps have brought me, you know, people in the rooms. I really value the connections that I make, not just for the connections and for the friendships, but also because, you know, I'm in these rooms because of where I was thinking. So it's nice to be able to see where everybody else is thinking. And I was at a meeting the other day where they were like, well, psychic change, psychic change. And to me, that's just perspective shift, you know, and I can't shift my perspective if I don't hear other people's perspectives. So um, I think I'll end just with, you know, I can't do this alone. I know that. And I need to help other people so that I can help myself. And that's what the rooms give me. So thank you. My name is Gil. I'm a recovered alcoholic. Hi, Gil. Hi, Gil. I have a sobriety date of November 17th, 1982. I just a couple of weeks ago crossed 37 years uh, clean and sober. And the single most important thing I can say about that entire 37-year period, I can sum up in four words. I didn't drink today. It's just that simple, you know? I can't change a single thing I did yesterday, you know? But if I'm sober... I stand a chance of learning from it, you know? If if I picked up a drink yesterday and I didn't mean to, and I don't pick up a drink today, I can look back and say, you know, that might not have been such a good idea. Let me try it again today. I don't have to worry about whether I'm going to pick up a drink tomorrow. That's not here yet, you know? But the things that I do today just might inform whatever decision I make when tomorrow does get here. Um, I'm fortunate, lucky, blessed enough that relapse is not part of my story. That doesn't make me any better 
than anybody who relapse is part of their story. I just happen to have had my last drink so far uh, before I got to the program. Um, congratulations, every, everybody who's, who's new uh, for getting here. Uh, and, and by new, I mean uh, with less time than either Fred or myself. Um, <laughs> um, keep, and keep coming, it gets better. Um, I am a comfort-seeking missile. I don't like not feeling good. You know, I don't. It sucks not feeling good. And I will, if there's something that I think is going to help me feel good, I'm going to make a beeline straight for it. You know, and growing up, my childhood, it was a fairly abusive environment, and I used to escape into my head uh, to, 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 to try to just escape what was going on, and then suddenly discovered, like, drugs and alcohol, and oh my God, yes, I have found the magic solution to feeling better in life, is to do drugs and alcohol, and the more, the better, you know? I, I used to try to figure out when did I become an alcoholic. I used to people say, oh yeah, you know, I was a social drinker for a while, and then at some point I crossed the line and I became an alcoholic. And I was like, huh, I, I wonder when I crossed the line. When did I become an alcoholic? When did I go from being a social drinker to becoming an alcoholic? And my, my sponsor at the time, he said, you know, it doesn't matter when you became an alcoholic. The, the, the thing is you're an alcoholic now. It would be like a pickle trying to figure out when it stopped being a cucumber and cross the line to being a pickle. It really doesn't matter because it's never going to be a cucumber again. You know, you soak yourself in brine long enough, you get pickled. But I was still obsessed with it, you know, because I've got a little bit of OCD going on, and when I get my, you know, and I'm just going to chew it up until I figure it out. And I just kept backing it up a little bit and backing up a little bit. And I got all the way back to age five when for the Sunday dinner, we're having like spaghetti and meatballs. My parents decided it would be fun to give the kids a little bit of burgundy, you know, with the Sunday dinner. Gallo screw top burgundy, you know, the good stuff. <laughs> And I remember this day. Probably that alone qualifies me to be an alcoholic because of all the memories I have, this day is crystal clear. Because here I am, I'm being allowed, encouraged to do this adult thing, this grown-up thing. Oh, my God, you know, because being a kid sucked. So I figured the sooner I can get to being an adult, the better my life is going to feel. You know, so I'm being a lot, and, and I took a big swallow out of this glass and like almost spit it out because the stuff was nasty. You know, I was expecting like great Kool-Aid, something sweet, fun to drink that I could just chug, but, but I didn't spit it out. I, I swallowed it, and then I felt it. It just ran through the veins, down my arms, through my torso, into my legs. I was like, oh, my God, yes. Yes, and I, and I looked over at my sister's glass, and I thought, if she doesn't drink hers, I will. <laughs> so to recap, <laughs> I am five. I have had one swallow of wine, and I am thinking ahead to my next drink. I was born on this side of the line. Chances are, you know, it's because my mom was alcoholic and she drank and smoked all through her pregnancy. I'm not blaming her. It's just, you know, it could be a physiological thing that I am just had a predisposition to it and actually nothing that I could have done would have kept me from being an alcoholic. Did this just turn off, I hope? Yeah? Oh. oh. <laughs> Darn. Okay. Uh, that, huh? It's not you. It's not me. No, of course it's not me. It's never me. <laughs> it's always somebody else. <laughs> and if it ever is me, it was somebody else. No. <clears throat> it wasn't until I was a teenager that I started actively chasing this, you know, with my buddies. 
Uh, went out with my friends. One of them had stolen a bottle from his dad's liquor cabinet, and we went out and polished it off because, you know, we don't know how to drink alcohol. It's like, what, we're going to chug it like it's water or Kool-Aid or something like that. So my first time out drinking on my own, I blacked out. You know, my friends pulled me out of a muddy ditch that I'd landed in face down, and I was like, oh, yeah, my God, this is it. This is fun, you know? And that's the thing. It was fun. I had a lot of fun with drugs and alcohol, you know? How I survived as much fun as I was having is a mystery because there are friends of mine who are dead from doing combinations of drugs and alcohol that I far exceeded. So it's just the, the, it, not anything I did. Grace of God that I'm standing here, you know? I, I used to like to try to take credit for everything, you know, because I'm all that. And I, and I realized that, you know, this is an awful lot that I would like to take credit for that I had nothing to do with. Um, so having discovered now drinking with my friends, it became a challenge. I, I grew up in a time where drinking age was 18, so which meant we would tr start trying to buy alcohol from the time we were 14. And we would find the places that would sell to us. You know, there's a bunch of liquor stores that were owned by a bunch of drunks. You know, and what I would do is I would go in with my older guys, you know, the guys they had, uh, you know, they were over 18. So, you know, the, the owner got used to seeing my face in the store, even though he wasn't selling directly to me. And then I would take a chance and go in and see if I could buy and just have him recognize me. And it's amazing how many, the, you know, I'm a personable enough guy. I go in there. Hey, how's it going? Da, 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 da. Hey, uh, hey, you know, right? good to see you. What do you need? Da, 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 da. You know, it was, it was great. I guess. <laughs> I joined a street gang because I felt safer running in a street gang in the streets of New York than I did going home at night. Um, I gravitated towards people whose mindset was like mine. Fuck you, I'm going to take whatever I want. You know? And if you don't like it, well, fuck you twice, I'm going to take it anyway. Um... I got, I got jobs where we, we would steal from the clients. Um, and I really thought nothing of it. Any Anytime my conscience would start to kick up a little bit, just go get a drink, you know, take some drugs, push those feelings down. I learned how to push any feelings I didn't like down with drugs and alcohol. We used to call uh, drinking liquid courage. You know, before we're going to go up and do something, we, we, we'd have a couple shots of liquid courage. Um, I realized now it wasn't courage. It just removed inhibitions. There's a difference between removing inhibitions and courage, you know. And I removed a lot of inhibitions against shit I should have inhibitions against doing, you know, like walking up to the biggest guy in the bar and swinging at him and hoping that my buddies have my back, mm -hmm. you know, because while I was a bully and a gang member, I would routinely get my ass kicked. And so I'd have to drink because I didn't feel good. If things went right in my life, I drank to celebrate. The thing is, I had a lot of fun with it. And then at some point it turned on me. You know? Um, all these inhibitions that I was ruined, the consequences. I was getting harder and harder to outrun the consequences of the choices that I was making with no inhibitions, with no moral compass. You know? The stealing, the lying, the cheating. Um, and so I started changing situations. I started moving. I moved from New York up to New Hampshire. I moved from New Hampshire down to Massachusetts. Uh, and no matter where you go, there you are, you know? And uh, we just kept finding myself in the same situations over and over and over again. I, I, used, to, I, used, I used to complain, Nobody, nobody's giving me a break. I can't catch a break. Truth is... I got more breaks than anyone has any right to be entitled to. You know, people were willing to hire me, even though I'd been fired from the last couple of jobs, because I could just walk in and talk a good game. Um, you know, and, and I showed up with all of the best intentions, 
But when it came down to my choice in actions, that was a whole different um, ball of wax. I, I saw a meme on Facebook. I, I get all my best spiritual advice from Facebook. Um, and I saw a meme that said, do not trust an apology that's not, com that's not accompanied by a change in behavior. You know, and that was me. I would apologize. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I wouldn't change the behavior. I would just hope that if I apologized, you'd forgive me and I could just continue on my role. Um, and when you were no longer willing to trust me, forgive me, I would just get rid of you and go find some other people to hang out with, you know. Um, I kept trying to fix what was wrong on the inside by decorating the outside of my life. It was going to be the next job. It was going to be the next girlfriend. It was going to be the next place that I lived. It was going to be the next car that I had. Uh, what's going to make me feel better? And the truth is, they did. Until they didn't. You know? The, the newness of it, that exciting, you know... I mean, the, they call it now uh, retail therapy. <laughs> you know, where people, they, they, they don't feel good, so they go buy something, and they feel great, but the feeling doesn't last, so they have to go buy something else. <laughs> and the next thing you know, I got a house full of shit I don't even really want, <laughs> and, I, I, and, and, I, and I don't feel good, and I don't feel good about having all this stuff to boot. So I've been getting rid of a lot of it, uh, you know, and trying to clean my life out. I mean, this, this follows me into sobriety. You know, I, I didn't, like, become saintly when I quit drinking, you know. It just, uh, far from it. You, 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 you take a drunken horse thief and you sober him up. What you have is a sober horse thief. <laughs> um, I like to think that everything that goes on up here is my thought, because I'm that smart, you know. But I remember... Every once in a while, like at age 17, hanging out with my friends, and this thought pops into my head that says, your drinking is off the charts even compared to your friends. You might be an alcoholic. And that scared me. It got my attention, you know. That's not my thought. At age 17, my thought is, yeah, we're getting fucked up. <laughs> That's my thought. Not, huh. I wonder how my drinking compares to my friends. Maybe I should do something about it. So I, I went up to my buddy Randy, because I thought maybe I should check this out with somebody. Randy was a couple years older than me. I really respected him. Mentioned it to him, and he thought about it for a second. He puts his brotherly arm around my shoulder. He says, you know, Gil, you can't be an alcoholic, because you drink like I do. And I'm not an alcoholic. <laughs> That's the answer I wanted, you know? Because if Randy had said, whoa, dude, you know what? You're right. Let's get you to a detox. I'd be like, whoa, not so fast. And I'd have gone and talked to Charlie, and I'd have gone and talked to Johnny, and I'd have gone and talked to anybody else until I got to the person that said, no, your drinking is just fine. Because I wanted my drinking to be just fine the way it was. Thank you very much. I wanted the rest of the world to be the problem. Spoiler alert, nothing out there has changed in 37 years that I've been sober. My relation to it has. You know, I'm in a place in my life today that I'm grateful for. I'm comfortable today in my life. And anytime I'm feeling a little discomfort, I have a set of tools that help me deal with it. And these tools do not include uh, running. They don't include drinking. They don't include taking drugs. Um, but back to my story. Um, because it was just getting good for me. Anyway, I don't know how it is for you out there. It's just, um, and I continued drinking and for another 10 years. I drank my way in and out of two marriages. I drank my way out of the right to watch two absolutely perfect little girls grow up on a daily basis. Um, I was experiencing what they refer to as pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. I, I was fired for drinking on the job. You know, this really hadn't happened before, you know. 
Now, they, they also told me, well, you know, you were the last one hired, and we're slowing down, so we got to let you go first. And your numbers aren't quite what they are, other people's numbers are, and you've been drinking on the job. <laughs> and whenever anybody asked me why I lost the job, I would give them the first few reasons. But I wouldn't give them the, I was, because that had nothing to do with it, you know. They were just making shit up to justify getting rid of me, um, even though I'd been caught drinking on the job on a number of occasions. Um, I didn't think I was that bad. I didn't think I was that bad right up to the last swallow that I took. I never tried to quit drinking. The entire time I was out there drinking, I never tried to quit. I tried, you know, I, I had those mornings where I'd wake up, oh my God, that is horrible. I am never doing that again. And what I meant by that was I'm never going to get that bad again. I'm going to drink. But I'm not going to get that bad because I actually thought I could control my drinking. I thought I was in control, that I was choosing to drink, that I was choosing this much. The, the, uh, that much, huh? <laughs> I was hoping that said five minutes. <laughs> All right, 20 minutes. All right. Um, that I was choosing to drink this much. The, my last drunk, I was helping a friend up in New Hampshire. I was living in Cambridge, Massachusetts at the time, about 45 minutes south. New Hampshire's north, the Cambridge south. You get it. Anyway. Um, and we'd had a couple of beers while I'm helping him out. And I had, I had a date that night. I, I managed to trick a woman into, I mean, I had a date. <laughs> <laughs> So I leave his house, and I stop at the store. I pick up two 16-ounce cans of beer, cause, and I was just tossing the second one behind the seat when I pulled in front of the liquor store that was around the corner from my house where I bought a six-pack of 16-ounce Budweiser's and a pint of Yukon Jack, with my intention being I'm going to have one or two pulls off of the bottle, one, maybe two beers, you know, to uh, liquid courage for the date. And by the time it rolled around time to leave for the date, it was all gone. And I thought, oh, well, you know, I, I guess I was thirsty. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what it was. I was thirsty. I didn't realize that I had lost choice in drink. You know, that when I take that first swallow of alcohol, alcohol owns me. If there's alcohol present and I'm conscious, I am going to drink it. I do not have the off switch that social drinkers have. I was married to a social drinker. My second wife was a social drinker. It was a phenomenon to, to witness. We, we, we'd be having these wine coolers, you know, because diluting wine is always a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Having these wine coolers. And at some point, she'd be like, you know, I think I'm done. And she still got half of her second one left. And she goes in the kitchen, and she gets a piece of saran wrap <laughs> and puts it over the top. And I'm like, what are you doing? She goes, well, I'm saving. I said, why don't you just finish it? She goes, I don't want it. I go, well, I'll finish it. She says, well, I might want it later. <laughs> and she would put this in the refrigerator where it would taunt me. Ha, ha, you can't drink me. Laura will be pissed if you drink me. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> you know I risked my wife's ire. <laughs> I always drank it and always felt guilty. So I would have to go to the store, of course, and buy <laughs> another bottle just in case she actually did want the the wine. Um, but this is me. I don't have a mechanism that says no to alcohol if I've started putting alcohol in my system. Um, but again, I didn't know this until I got here. Um, so anyway, back to the... I, this was like pre-internet dating. Yeah, back when like you these throwaway rags. It was uh, the Cambridge tab 
was the throwaway rag back there. Here, I guess, it's the Guardian and uh, East Bay uh, Express, where they used to have classified ads on the back pages before the Internet came up and Match.com and Tinder and all of that, you know, where you had 20 words to describe your ideal mate. Uh, and for the person reading the ad, what you had to do is you had to write a reply to the ad with the box number, and you put it in an envelope with the box number on the outside of the envelope, and then put that in another envelope and mail it to the newspaper, who would then pull these envelopes out, forward the envelope to the individual who placed the ad in the first. This could take a couple of weeks. <laughs> None of this swipe left, swipe right for gratification shit, you know? You really had to work for it and wait for it and all of that. And I, It wasn't my favorite, but it was the best we had, you know? And I sent off six, because, you know, I was feeling pitiful about myself and thought what I needed was another relationship because <laughs> this time I'd get it right <laughs> and what I remember about all six of the ads I responded to each one specified they wanted either a light social or non-drinker and I figured at a quarter Jack Daniels and a six, maybe two six packs of beer a night, I was light social. <laughs> Even though I was doing this by myself. <laughs> the three women actually responded yeah. to my letters. They, they got back in touch with me. Two of them agreed to meet me after talking with me on the phone. One of them fled in terror within 15 <laughs> seconds of me. She literally took one look at me and was like, yeah, I pretty much have anything else to do right now. <laughs> I offered to walk her to her car, but no, that's fine. No, please don't. I didn't feel good, but, you know, I get it now. <laughs> I wouldn't have wanted me to walk me to my car. <laughs> and the sixth woman actually agreed to meet me and have dinner at her house. So here I am having consumed all the alcohol in my house, and I'm standing in her doorway, and the only reason I'm not falling down is I have part of the door on either side of me. <laughs> <laughs> and she looks at me and she goes, you're drunk. <laughs> and it wasn't a question. Like, have you been drinking? No, you're drunk. <laughs> but she didn't kick me out. She invited me in. She fed me. She listened to my tale of woe which I now call my drunk a lot, um, <laughs> about how horrible my life was. And if people would just treat me better, my drinking would, you know, da-da-da-da. And, she, and I, didn't, I didn't even mention my drinking, just my life felt horrible. And she was like, you know, maybe if you talked with a counselor, they could help you see where you keep setting yourself up to fail. Because it seems like no matter where you move, what kind of job you have, what people you have around you, it's the same story. And maybe if you talk with a counselor, they can help you create a new story. Every once in a while, I guess the right answer. Because the last thing I want to do is talk to anybody about anything except her. You know, but I'm like, well, sure. Uh, if, if you want to give me a number, uh, I'll call. She goes, you can use my phone. I go, well, I, I, I don't know who to call. She goes, I do. <laughs> what I was to find out later is that uh, in her past job was a drug and alcoholism counselor. <laughs> so I called, and you know, it was a Saturday night, so I left a message, um, and this seemed to satisfy her, and then I went home and... Uh, I never followed up. Um, that was Wednesday, November 17th, 1982. And I know it was a Wednesday because I woke up on Thursday morning and, oh, I had gotten home Thursday, Wednesday night. And as I walked into my room, this is in Somerville, Massachusetts, middle of November. It was an early snow that year. I was dressed pretty much like this, 
having walked from Boston to Somerville, and I got to my place and I'm numb. And I don't know if I'm numb because I've been out in the cold for so long, or if I'm numb because I have so much alcohol in me. And it was just a, as if a light went off. You know, all the lights were on in my room, but it was as if a light went on. <laughs> and this thought passed through my head that felt like a voice speaking directly to me says, you need to stop drinking. You need to go to AA. And the light went out. And it rattled me. Again, this is another one of those thoughts that I thought was mine, but there was nobody to check it out with, you know, but it it got my attention. It got my attention. Um, shook it out that night. Woke up the next morning, and I opened up the phone book. For some of you who are, you know, <laughs> in your 30s or younger, there, there used to be these things called phone books. <laughs> they were about this fat, and they had everybody's phone number in it. It was like, you had to actually apply, especially not to have your phone number listed in this book. And I called what turned out to be central office in Boston. Uh, they made it real easy to find in because the, the phone book was uh, alphabetical, you know, A-A. <laughs> <laughs> and I called, and this very patient individual starts reading me the entire meeting list for the Boston area. And I'm like, nope, don't want to go there. Nope, don't like that one. Nope, oh no, oh no, not that one. And, I've never been to any of these places, <laughs> much less an AA meeting. These were all churches, like this. I wasn't going to go to a church. I said, well, you know, we, we can send someone around to take you to a meeting. I know the hard sell when I hear one, guys. <laughs> and now I hung up the phone, and this is even before it's Star 69, where they could call me back. <laughs> you know, it's that long. Is this Star 69 is still a thing? I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> this is back when the phone was attached to the wall. <laughs> you weren't putting this thing in your pocket and going far. <laughs> Somehow, I didn't drink that day. And the next day, I called back. And another very patient individual starts reading me the entire meeting list for Friday for the Boston. I'm like, again, nope, don't want to go there, nope, nope. But I realize I'm going to have to say yes to something at some point. So if I, oh, wait, yes, that one. It was Our Lady of Pity. <laughs> I felt pitiful. These are my people. So I walk in. There's a room like this, you know, um, gaily decorated. Walk in through the back like that, and then I smelled it. The coffee. And next to the coffee was a huge pile of cookies. You know? And I'm not sure what to do. You know, because there's a guy standing up front talking about what it's like to be drunk. I already know what it's like to be drunk. I don't need to listen to him. <laughs> and, I, and I make a pass past the coffee pot, just tr trying to be casual. <laughs> I'm the only person moving around in the room. <laughs> and it's six foot two. <laughs> I'm thinking I'm subtle. <laughs> I make a couple passes past the coffee pot, and I don't see the box to put money in. I'm not sure how you pay for this, and I don't want to just take it. Because this guy's got a direct sight. Hey, you didn't pay for that shit. Put it back. Put it back. Just dump it in the top. You know. I didn't know how much the free coffee cost. If there's anybody in the room tonight who doesn't know how much the free coffee costs, ask the person next to you, okay? So I sat down, and I'm shaking, and I'm shaking, and I sat there, and and they called, I guess they called a break, and back, back then, uh, meetings were an hour and a half, they had a break in the middle for smoking, um, and so I'd been there maybe 10 minutes, and thought, okay, that's enough for my first meeting, and I was about to walk out, and this big guy uh, is standing in the doorway, blocking you know, rude of him. I'm, I'm trying to get around him, and he just kind of keep going like this. And eventually he sticks his hand out, and he says, welcome, you're new. And it was not a question. 
<laughs> See, I had taken great pains not to look like an alcoholic. I, I had on my cleanest, dirty clothes. I hadn't bothered to shower, but I slicked my hair back the best that I possibly could. You know, I looked special. And I go, well, what gave me away? He says, two things gave you away. He said, one, you're the only person in the room who doesn't have a cup of coffee. And if you wait right here, I'll go get you a cup of coffee. This guy is my new best friend. <laughs> and he comes back with a styrofoam cup, half a cup of coffee, and a hundred sugars. Newcomer coffee, basically. The reason for the hundred sugars is that the body metabolizes alcohol and sugar the same way. You got a, you got a craving to drink, eat something sweet. It will help take care of the craving. Uh, the reason for it being half a cup is because I'm standing there like this. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, what was the second thing that gave me away? He said, oh, you're sitting in the beginner's seat. <laughs> but he is. Um, the one <laughs> furthest in back, closest to the door, ready to have an escape. <laughs> and then he did something remarkable. He took out his own personal copy of the meeting list for the Boston area and opened it up to Saturday. Circled a meeting Saturday night. He said, I'm going to be here. Why don't you show up and meet me? And he hands me his own personal copy of the book. I still have that book. I showed up. I'm not sure which one of us was more surprised. <laughs> and he turned to the guy he was talking to and said, what meeting do you go to tomorrow night? By the end of the week, I had a full schedule of meetings with somebody that I knew, or at least would recognize at each of those meetings. So I didn't feel like such an outsider when I, when I got to a meeting. Um, I've been coming ever since, and I was just given the five-minute thing, so I should probably talk a little bit about recovery. <laughs> if you want long-term sobriety, you only need to do two things. Don't drink. Don't die. That's not long-term recovery. That's just sobriety. That's, you want long-term recovery, don't drink, don't die, and work the steps took me three and a half years to do my first fourth step. I do not recommend this. I was in a world of hurt for three and a half years. I had no new tools. But this sober horse thief had no new tools for dealing with the situations in his life. When I got into the steps, my life started to turn around. Um, when I started to develop a relationship with a power outside of myself, a power greater than myself, I don't even know what it is. I don't need to. All I know is it works. You know? I can't tell any of you how an internal combustion engine works. But I know if I sit in my car and I turn the key and I've done all the correct maintenance, the car starts. You know? And it gets me from point A to point B. I have to do a certain amount of maintenance. Um, my first sponsor tricked me into my first fourth step. <laughs> I called him up complaining yet again about what a horrible life I have and everybody's being mean to me and nobody's like, you know, nah, nah, nah. and he said, look, I want to talk to you about this, but I'm about to go out to dinner with my wife. So do me a favor, write it down so you don't forget about it. And I go, oh, I'm not going to forget about this one. And he said, no, no, do me a favor. This is for me. Okay. Do me a favor and write it down so you don't promise me. I said, okay, fine, because like, I can guess the right answer sometimes. He said, good, and while you're at it, if you can think about anything else you're pissed off about, write that down too. Because I want to talk to you about it later. <laughs> right, that's a fifth step. <laughs> but it got me into the steps, and the relief that I was starting to feel as a result of doing the steps badly it was amazing. So that it got me interested in, well, how do I do them even better? You know, how do I get more relief? Because like I said at the top of my share, I'm a comfort-seeking missile. I will head straight towards whatever it is that's going to provide me with a modicum of relief if I'm not 
feeling good. And the steps are what does it for me. Inviting God into the equation is what does it for me. I don't have all of the answers, but like it talks about in our literature, the answers will come if your own house is in order. I get my house in order by doing the steps, by inviting God in and listening to the direction and trying it a different way just to see how it's going to work out. Um, And I have never woken up the next day after making a ninth step amend thinking, fuck, I wish I hadn't done that. (laughs) Now I feel worse. (laughs) Because amends aren't for the other person. Amends are for me. Like the amendments to the Constitution are not apologies that we have a Constitution. They're the changes to the document that make it a stronger document. The amends that I make out in the world, yeah, it's more powerful if I go up to, like if I'm just talking to Alexa and I say, you know, I shouldn't have screwed over Fred the other day. That's one thing. But if I go up to Fred and say, I shouldn't have screwed you over the other day, way more powerful, you know. Last person I want to tell. (laughs) But it's in doing that that I realize that if I don't screw anybody over, I don't have to go back to them later and say, I wish I hadn't done that. You know, I I, I start to learn how to make different choices. I don't know from better for worse, um, but different, you know. And then I get to decide as a result of making new choices sober, which ones I want to allow to inform my choices moving forward tomorrow. On a good day, I let them all. Bad choices, I let inform, say, no, don't do that again. Good choices, yeah, I want to do more of that. You know, as a result, what I do every morning now is I wake up and before I get out of bed, I find a place of gratitude. It's there. I can find it because I get to choose who gets out of bed, you know, regardless of what's in front of me that day, regardless of what happened yesterday, regardless of what's going on in my life. There's something I can be grateful for if I want to find it, you know. And today I want to find it because I don't like getting out of bed as a grumpy old man. I like getting out of bed, feeling much better about myself. So I find this place of gratitude, and the next thing I do is I look up and I say, please direct my thinking, my short version of the third step prayer. You know, I don't know what all the answers are. I might need some help making some decisions today. Please direct my thinking, you know. I have my good days. I have days not as good as others, but those are my learning days, you know. I haven't had a bad day in a long time. Uh, And it's only because a day at a time I've chosen not to pick up a drink and to work this program as perfectly or as imperfectly as I'm capable of on any given day. Uh, We're not saints. None of us has done this perfectly. But a day at a time, if I'm sober, I stand a chance, you know. I want to thank Alexa (laughs) for asking me to speak in the group for letting me be of service tonight. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.